鸡蛋牛奶王朝。有一天我看过三个娘。嗯，那是个。That is honestly one of the best roja mos I've ever had. I think every roja mos should be built like this. Oh, yo, that's so good in the soup. <laughs> this was like one of the best things I've ever eaten, man. The quality <laughs> is all star level.、Oh. Our next Chinese region is not just a province, but an ancient trade route. At one point, the Silk Road was the only link from the Western world to the Middle East to East Asia. They traded things like silk, horses, spices, and of course, food recipes. Some say it's how Marco Polo ended up bringing noodles and dumplings back from China to Italy. The food that occurred along the Silk Road is a fascinating mix of different influences. Each city along the pathway, from Gansu to Henan to Xi'an and more, was impacted in a different way by the Silk Road. Our first spot is Dunhuang, named after a city in Gansu Province on the edge of the Gobi Desert that was a major stop on the Silk Road. Let's go. Aren't you guys starting off our Silk Road episode of what Chinese food are you actually eating, Andrew? We are starting in a place called Dunhuang, Gansu. Now, Lanzhou is the capital of Gansu, but you know it's bordering a ton of different places, and you see that reflected in the food. Now, I think immediately a lot of people are not familiar with the name of Gansu, but it's a very, very significant province when it comes to the Silk Road, most notably the big cities as Dunhuang and Lanzhou. And a lot of people are, of course, familiar with the Lanzhou La Mian, which is you know the famous noodles, which they do have here. But what I love about Gansu is that they have a bunch of influences from Mongolia, Tibet, Xinjiang. Sichuan, Shanxi, Xi'an—you know those places. So the food is very colorful, but it also uses a lot of the dry rubs. I will tell you this, guys: if you are only familiar with American Chinese food, maybe Shanghainese food, Cantonese food, Taiwanese, you are not going to recognize much of this. But I can assure you, Dunhuang is delicious. I gotta give a huge shout out to our sponsor of this video, Raw Wallets. As you can see, they got a brand new logo. We talked about this wallet about six or seven years ago. We gave it a great review. I still think. It's a great wallet. As you can see, you can wear it in your front pocket, back pocket, keychain loop right here. Really sleek, you know, modern materials. They stretch out. Room for your cash, membership cards, ID cards, credit cards, debit cards, Metro card, and I like how the cash sticks out on both sides, but it really traps it in there. This. Like is not going anywhere, guys. This is not becoming loose, and it's low profile for me. The way I carry AirPods, you know, light with me, everything. This goes right in my pocket. I'm ready to go raw wallets. Andrew, of course, we have the Da Pan Ji. Man, I feel like this dish and its many variants have made the most appearances on our channel before, David. Yo, what I love, these are all handmade, hand pulled, hand squeezed, hand put together noodles. Oh my gosh. Oh my goodness. Let's go in for this first. Mmm, that mm. is a good da pan ji. Very herbal and a little bit more soupy. Personally, I like the sauce to be a lot thicker, but this one's pretty good. This is a very high quality version. Next up here at Dunhuang, Andrew, we've got the shou zhua yang rou. Andrew, this is actually a dish from the Inner Mongolian influence of Nei Rong Mongu. Yeah, and what I love is that it's all in the name, guys. Shou zhua means handheld. And that means that you're supposed to eat this with your hand, and it's just gonna fall off. And this、bone. is not the only time we've had this dish or covered it. You know,、um, sometimes a lot of northwestern Chinese food, in, you know, Qinghai, Nei Mongu, it has similar things. But Andrew, it's always a little different depending on which place you get it. Especially this restaurant, it's super high quality and nice. They're gonna give you this fresh garlic to eat with it, along with the seasonings. Guys, let's go in. Hmm. The quality <laughs> is all star level. Huh? This plate was twenty bucks. Totally worth it. Totally worth it for the handheld lamb. Wow, David, this is the best handheld thing to drop since the iPhone. So Andrew,、uh, Gansu Province is actually very poor on like most you know metrics, but it kind of goes to show you that poor places can still produce some amazing food. Here we have the world famous Lanzo La Mian, and there's going to be a lot of spots that serve this dish. But the most distinct features are this noodle here was one entire noodle before we cut it with the scissors. Now, the oldest evidence of noodles in the entire world is 4,000 years old, and it was actually found in a place that borders Qinghai and Gansu Province. So you know that this area has had noodles for thousands of years. That is crazy. It's, there's not going to be any pork because it's from the Hui people, and the slices of Beef are very, very thin and actually pretty lean. 
you guys, Lanzo mm. Lamian around China, Andrew, I'd say it's like as popular or maybe more popular than Japanese ramen. Well, guys, think about it. If Lanzo in this area has some of the oldest evidence of noodles and it's called Lamian and that turned into the word ramen, then this might, this is pretty much the closest thing you get to a Japanese ramen in China that's actually very, very Chinese. So this is like an ancient, I would just, this might just be, you could just probably call this the original ancient Chinese ramen. Andrew, we have a beef and potato dish. Very, very simple. You know, they just do it a very certain way out in Dunhuang. Mm. You know what's funny? Because David, no matter what part of the world you go to, beef stews, I don't know, like a lot of them kind of feel similar. This is really good though. Here we have some pretty cool appetizers. This is something that you do not see at a lot of Chinese restaurants. This is the huo ba kao bing. Huo ba, you know, having to do something with fire. Kao bing, of course, grilled bread. Look how crispy it is, dipped in chili oil. Guys, this is just roasted bread dipped in chili oil. Come on. Mm. I'm a fan of Montos before they're grilled. Wow. <laughs> I'm an even bigger fan post grill. This is like the spicy Chinese breadstick right here. I'm a, I, I, you could dip this in anything too. Mm. Andrew, like we said, Gansu province has so many different influences. If you look at it, it kind of looks like a sock touching like seven other provinces. This what? is actually an influence from the Sichuan side, but this is Lanzhou style koshui ji from Sichuan. Yeah, so this is mouthwatering chicken, obviously a very famous dish in Sichuan. But as you can see, it, there's a little bit more greens and a little bit more color in this one. Mm. Guys, here we have the roja more with lamb in it. And what I like to see about this is how many peppers and onions are in there. It kind of almost looks like a Mexican dish. But like I said, you know, there's actually similarities with Mexican food. As far as the spices, it doesn't taste the same, but it looks the same. Andrew, start your campaign right now, because I know you are a fervent advocate for putting more things in roja more. Yo, make roja more amazing again. Gansu roja more. It kind of does taste mm. like one of those extra spicy beef empanadas. I did not have food from Lanzo, Dunhuang, Gansu province till much later in my life. And let me tell you this, I am glad I discovered it. What I think is so amazing about China as a whole is that you can get food like Shanghainese food, you can get really nice, soft, delicate food, and you can also just get some really spicy, kind of dry, cumin-y food as well. And it's, and it's all under the umbrella of Chinese food. And I think that is pretty incredible. Andrew, you are looking at a Jida Niu Na Wang Zhao. Whoa! So basically, guys, this is a sweet egg dessert with the uh, egg whites and flower petals on top, a little some chrysanthemum on my Bro, brain. this is an egg dessert. This is a hot egg dessert. I have never seen this in my life. Steamed egg dessert, guys. Oh my goodness. After having Tibetan and Mongolian milk tea, I don't know, I can't say, but it feels like that this might have some of that influence. But guys, adding the egg is crazy. It's really, it's really just savory, a little sweet, creamy, but not very heavy. This, is, this was a nice way to end off the meal. This might be one of my favorite Chinese restaurants in New York City. Andrew, next up on our exploration of the Chinese cuisine, we are dealing with the zones that were pretty much the end of the Silk Road. So we're talking about Shanxi, Gansu, Henan. Now, a lot of these foods are Muslim influenced, but they are, at the end of the day, still very Chinese. This region is most famous for its big, long, wide noodles that you're gonna be pulling. It's very spicy, lots of cumin in them and most notably, it is gonna be called Xi'an food. This region also has a lot of influence from Northwestern China, Qinghai, also, Andrew, Inner Mongolia, so we're gonna be including this whole section in this video. Andrew, opening up the Xi'an wave noodle food video, what do we got? You have the water basin mutton noodle soup. This is something that, you know, you're. it's gonna be hard to find. Now, the cool thing is about Bites of Xi'an, they have some very, like, Americanized dishes that are gonna appeal to the masses, but they also have this dish, which is very traditional. They didn't use the wheat noodles, they used the vermicelli, and I thought that was a cool switch up. This is one of the best lamb noodles I ever had in my life. David, that's pretty crazy that you're saying that considering Bites of Xi'an also has some Americanized dishes. What can you say to the people that are gonna say, man, that's crazy. Hey, they did a good job of balancing what they wanted to serve with what the market demanded. Here I have the Qi Shan Sao Zi Mian, and that actually is referring to the cube cut carrots that are in this. And this is a pretty deep cut dish. You're not gonna find this at every Xi'an restaurant. This dish actually dates back to the Shang Dynasty, so. Ooh. 
Mmm, sour, spicy, a little bit pungent. Wow, that's flavorful. I think that is one of the more traditional, older tasting dishes that can still be relevant today. Shout out to Bites of Xi'an for serving this dish because they are really mostly known for, you know, lunch foods, but man, they got some deep cut historical dishes here. All right, you guys, this is the pork roja mua. Like we said, some people do not eat pork in that region, but at the end of the day, it's still China. They love eating pork. Oh my goodness, Let's just give it a try. That is honestly one of the best roja mua's I've ever had. Andrew, I suggest you oh try my. it. Wow. I think every roja mua should be built like this. Every roja mua should be designed like this with the flaky bow. Oh my gosh, it is almost like eating it between two scallion pancakes minus the scallion. Next noodle dish we have is the diao diao mian. And diao diao is referring to just the three elements that are mixed together. So it's almost like three separate dishes just all in one bowl, but they complement each other. Here's you got the shredded pork. This looks like the same pork that's gonna be in the rojia mu. Here you kind of have a zha jiang mian style sauce right here, which I'm actually pretty sure is the sauce that they're going for. And then you have the uh, tomato egg, which is also very popular. And you're just gonna mix those two up. First time having diao diao mian. between the black bean fried sauce noodle, which is the zhajiang mian, mixed in with a little bit of the acidity from the tomato, man. I love this mix. This is a good noodle. All right, let me try this, man. All right, you guys, this is the snack zone chicken dishes in Xi'an. Now, these are not 100% authentic, but Andrew, they do have a drenbing and they do actually have fried chicken in Xi'an. So these would be like street side, you could get them. It wouldn't fully look like this, but you know, they're working with the ingredients they got. The thinking is still there. Right, I mean, in America, it'll, it's gonna be very common for them to just grab the tortilla and use it. Obviously, this is clearly a uh, Mexican style tortilla, but it could still work and be very similar to the traditional one. And obviously this looks a little bit more like fried chicken pieces. However, I do think there is a fried chicken head somewhere. Is that the head? No. Okay. Mmm, got a little Xi'an spices in there. This is a Xi'an drenbing. Like we said, not 100% traditional, but you get the idea. Mmm. Wow. Got some peppers, cumin, heavy onion, which is very representative of this general region. This is a great way for people who are not exposed to the Xi'an flavor to get into it, because this form factor is super familiar. Obviously, it's pretty much a Xi'an burrito. It's portable, it's quick, it's filling, got flavor. I mean, they just got the right sauce on the right amount of noodles. And remember too, either Qingzhen food or Qingzhen influenced food is usually pretty clean too. A very popular drink in Xi'an is the pomegranate juice. Obviously, it's very hard to find in America, but the other option here is the plum drink. This is a popular Chinese drink, and I also like the bottle, so this is nice to wash down all the spices with. You know, this is a great way to end your lunch. Overall, my favorite Xi'an combo here for myself was the zu rou rou jia mu with the water basin mutton soup. This was like one of the best things I've ever eaten, man. My favorite has got to be the Qi Shan Yuro Mian. And this just has that sourness, pungentness that is just very, very unique to this region and unique to this dish. So, man, I think they did a great job. All right, everybody, that wraps it up here at Bites of Xi'an. Now, some people might walk in here and not say it's the most authentic Xi'an restaurant from top to bottom, but I will tell you this. They have some deep cut dishes and the traditional stuff they do have is amazing. On to the next pot. Guys, do you want to know a place that has been the home of seven different Chinese dynasties that has delicious food that nobody knows about? Well, welcome to Henan food. So this is one of the most famous styles of Henan food. This is a Hui Mian, and there's so many different styles in Henan because it's so historical, but it, one of the main features is this milky lamb broth with some mutton right here. And mutton, lamb, you know, mutton is the older version of lamb. Of course, it's still the same animal, of course, different age. Clear noodles, lots of kind of like little mountainous shrubs, got some mushrooms here, but man, yo, this is delicious. And also we have the Henan style roja mu. Of course, you've seen the roja mu so many times on our channel, but listen, a lot of people don't know about Henan food. It's actually really, really delicious, but that's only because Henan is not like the most famous province right now. So here at New Spicy Village, the main chef is Fujianese, but did live in Zhengzhou, which is the capital of Henan for a little while. So that's why they know how to cook the food, but maybe it's not like 100% authentic. Here, you have the Hui Mian. There's so many different styles in Henan. This always has a milky lamb broth. 
And of course you have the Hunan style Roja more, which I'm about to dip into the soup. Let me try this by itself real quick though. Hunan food is really interesting because part of it is really kind of based off the Silk Road because it was kind of at the end of the Silk Road, so it has a lot of that influence. But it's also really close to Shandong, which is like very, very Han Chinese style. So it's actually a really cool mixture, and it's too bad a lot of people don't know about the food. So this is the Roja Moor. This is the beef version. I have a pork version, obviously. You know, a lot of Roja Moors, you know, from the Muslim areas are not gonna have pork. Mmm. Oh. Yo, that's so good in the soup. Ooh, real juicy. I'm not gonna lie, guys. This bao or manto is actually kind of flat. Almost looks like a, I don't want to say an arepa, but it looks like a flat Mexican sandwiches. Oh my. The next dish that you might have not seen before, this is jiaozi in a sour soup. Now, listen, we've seen one ton before, but have you seen large dumplings in a slightly sour soup? Let me get a little goji berry in there. A little scoot in there. Mmm. Oh, it tastes healthy. Homemade, look at that. Lots of pork and chive in this one. Hunan food doesn't really strike you in either one way or one direction too strong, but it has a little bit of everything, which is really cool. And it kind of reminds me of like maybe like a state in the Midwest, like Illinois, something that has some East Coast culture, some West Coast culture, but might lean a little bit more East Coast. I don't know, but Hunan, because it's so close to very different provinces and has such a long history, I mean, you know, they're gonna have all different flavors, so I'm telling you, the food is underrated. What kind of Chinese man would I be if I'm not dipping my roja more into the soup to eat? Yeah, I think it went better with the lamb bone soup, but still really good. This is the combo right here. If you come to New Spicy Village, you gotta do this. Yo, David, we gotta go to Kaifeng. We gotta go to Chengzhou. We gotta go to Hunan. One of the things I noticed is that Hunan food, being sort of this mixture of north, south, east, west, has a very moderate flavor that almost reminds you of Americanized Chinese food. And this is a uh, pepper chicken dish, and the use of onions in a wok with soy sauce, garlic, is really, really common in Hunan. And guess where else that's common, guys? In American Chinese food, almost like Panda Express. Mmm. Yeah. I do not think there is a single dish that I've ever had that was more authentic than this that tasted almost inauthentic. It tasted like American Chinese food because of the flavor profile, because it's a little sweet, because of the heavy onion usage. What we have is a dry kui mian. Normally, the more ones that are like popular in China have that milky bone broth that takes five hours to develop. You gotta cook it out of the bones. This is actually a spicy lamb dry kui mian. Honestly, it's spicy, but it's not too spicy, which makes Hunan a perfect segue for people into the more like deep cut provinces of Chinese called food. They might have only had American Chinese food and then Hunan food. A lot of hipsters come to Spicy Village in New York City. All right, you guys, we are looking at Dapan Ji. Like we said, this was invented by the Hui people. There are a lot of Hui people in Hunan. Maybe not the most, but you know, they have enough to have their own Fa, basically their own methodology behind Da Parji. As you can see, the potatoes breaking apart, like Ooh. just, uh, like I'm just, uh. They actually grilled this chicken prior. I think that some people don't do that. Andrew, I know is a huge fan of the grilled chicken prior to being put with the other ingredients. Da Panji Hunan style. This is actually one of my favorite styles. I think my two favorite styles, and number one is Shan Shi with Xi'an style Da Panji. Number two is Hunan style. Especially on the East Coast, I think this is one of the trendiest noodle dishes, probably the trendiest noodle dish in America from the Chinese world because it has so many unique flavors and it's such an interesting mix of some Middle Eastern influence and Chinese influence. I know that this Fujinese owned Hunan spot is not fully representative of what you can get in Kaifeng or in Zhengzhou, but I actually thought they did a pretty decent reproduction. These are my two favorite dishes right here. Mm. As for me, my favorite dishes has gotta be this combination. The roja moi dipped into the hui man broth that took five hours to cook. That's why it's milky and it's lamby. This is my recommendation. Guys, we're in front of Fat Cat Guo Kui, AKA Fei Mao Guo Kui. I got a brown sugar joint. This is actually where this style is from. They eat it a lot in Beijing, but this is the uh, real authentic thing. Fei Mao was a brand from Hubei, uh, sort of the, uh, you know, our Hui 
influence regions, which is, there's a lot of them. I mean, Henan, Hebei, Shanxi, Xi'an. This one's brown sugar. Uh, they do really like this food in Beijing. We didn't put it in the Beijing food episode. We could have, but it is from Hubei. This ain't 2022 like delicious, but it's just got that feeling. I'm just back 2000 years ago. This is one of my favorite snacks to have in China, and I haven't had anything from a chain from Hubei before, but look how big this thing is, man. You know they cook it in what looks to be like a tandoori style oven. And break it, this is the salted pork one. Huge, they cut it in half for you. Look at this thing. I don't know all the full history, but this might be one of the best products to come from the Silk Road. Mm. So this is a very, very thin flatbread. Now, different mm. regions are gonna do it differently. Sichuan has one that they tout is the best one. Uh, I actually had one in Chengdu a long time ago that was really good. So for me, it's hard to say, but this is the popular style. It's super, super thin. Just a little bit of meat. You can almost fold it up like three times. Just roll it up like that. Guys, this snack is blowing up all over Beijing and all parts of China. So we could have put it in the Beijing street food episode. However, hey, you gotta give credit where it's due. This is from Hubei. Mmm. Wow, that's good.